Okay, welcome to Ecology Lecture 1. I'm trying to zoom out for the recording, so we'll see how it goes. Okay, let's try this out. Um, you can see my little face over there. Hello, everybody. Okay, so we are starting ecology, and we really, I only really have one big PowerPoint for this, and then one PowerPoint for animal behavior, all right? So we are going to do two lectures for ecology for this one PowerPoint, and then one for animal behavior. And this will cover chapters 22, oh, sorry, 52 through 55. Um, so I've obviously condensed a lot of material, um, picking out the things that I think are the most important. Um, all right, so ecology first off is the study of how organisms interact with one another and their physical environment. Right. And again, Mr. Anderson has quite, um, quite a lot of, uh, he's got three videos that you can always go watch as well. Oops, let me move that. All right. So population ecology center concentrates or centers mainly on factors affecting population size and composition. Not shocking. It's called population ecology. So this involves a couple factors. The first is birth rate. Right, and that's pretty simple. Number of births over total number of individuals in the population. And as you can imagine, there's also a death rate. Number of deaths per total number of people or individuals in the population that we're talking about. Right, to get the net reproduction, we are gonna subtract birth rate from death rate. Or rather, so yeah, subtract um, death rate from the birth rate, sorry. Birth rate minus death rate. And then using that, you can calculate the amount of population growth, whether it's growing or whether it's shrinking, right? Using that net reproduction and multiplying it by the numbers of individuals, all right? And just to see what kind of, just to give you a sense of what kind of questions I could ask on that, um, I have a couple example, um, examples here. So we're looking at a single population with 2,000 individuals. There are 100 births and 200 deaths. So if you just look at that, you can tell that there's more deaths, more deaths than births. So the population growth is probably going to be negative. So first, what you're gonna do is calculate the net reproduction, and then you're gonna figure out what the expected population is, right? So I made little flashcards that to show the, kind of to show the, um, how I did these. Hopefully that's gonna work for you up in the corner here, right? So net reproduction, is birth rate minus death rate, and calculate that. And then to get the expected population, you have to figure out first the net repro the um, population growth, all right? So again, sorry, I'm holding these up as a little funky, right? So here, expected population, first you need to figure out the net reproduction, which we did in A. Then you need to figure out the population growth. Here, the population growth is negative 100. So in the next generation, we have the number of individuals minus 100 to give you that expected population. Hopefully that way I did that works. Please give me feedback about that. Um, and here, I don't know where to put my face. All right, so interpretation of population um, growth curves, all right? So these are growth curves over time. We are looking at three different countries. Kenya, the United States, and Italy, all right? And this was obviously before the corona outbreak. Um, and it'll be actually, it'll be really interesting to see what happens during or, um, or after corona for, with these population curves. It'll be really interesting. So rapid growth in Kenya, you see that we have, um, that the amount of people, older people here on age on the y-axis is much smaller than the number of smaller people, or so smaller, younger people. Um, they're probably smaller too. So more people in the population are younger. Um, in the United States, we have what is called slow growth happening, where the, um, the people older, um, there are less people in the older generations, um, and we see a slight, increase as we go down to some younger people, but it's not huge, right? And you can see that we have a little bulge here, aka the baby boomers. 
And then we have Italy, where there's really zero growth or maybe even a decrease in growth, all right? Um, looking from about the 1960s going down to the 90s, we're actually seeing a decrease. So that's how to interpret those. All right, so what prevents or changes how environments grow? Um, so in other words, what are the limits of growth, right? Every environment, whether it is a big oak tree, um, whether it is the plains of Kansas, you know, um, or whether it's our globe, every environment has a maximum what's called carrying capacity. Um, right? And then above that carrying capacity, the population size will decline, right? So the carrying capacity really is what environment, what um, parts of the environment can really hold and support all of the populations or all of the people or people or organisms, whatever we're talking about. So here we're looking at gra a graph from 1985 to 1995, white-tailed deer. And you can see growth populate or populations grew quite dramatically, and then it went down once it reached carrying capacity. We saw another explosion of growth. Once you cross that carrying capacity, it then went down again, right? So above carrying capacity, um, it can go slightly above that, but population will always go down. That means the, the environment cannot support more of those organisms. And there's some really cool examples of this. Um, for example, if you look at two populations at the same time. So here we're looking at the bunny or the hare population size and the accompanying lynx population size, right? So what's really cool about this, and if you look at these kind of graphs really carefully, and on the um, in-class test, there will be um, these kinds of data interpretation questions. Um, most of the time, people kind of just get them, um, but you have to really know what you're looking for, right? So we are looking for um, at these different populations, and what we can see is that almost every time there is a black spike, meaning there's an increase in hair population, that is accompanied by a quick increase in lynx population, right? But once the lynx come up, then the snowshoe hair population declines again. Pike, spike in hair, spike in lynx. Spike in hair, spike in lynx. So we always get a spike in that hair population first. That provides a lot of food for the lynx, so their population shoots up, the lynx eat all the hair, their population goes down, and then the lynx population go down because, because there's no more food. All right, so the predator-prey relationships um, really also play heavily into these carrying capacities and these limit limitations on growth. So I just looked this up um, and on the current world population counter um, as of two days ago. It was 7.7 .7 billion, um, according to the United Nations estimates. All right, um, that's quite a lot of people. And so what is the Earth's carrying capacity? All right, so let's check this out. All right, so let me, I'm gonna go ahead and open this link. Probably gonna have to change my share screen. Let's see. Okay, let's see if I can get this going for you. There's just, oh, hmm. Do, 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 do. Oh, just stop it. Um, oh, there should have been a quick movie. Oh, here, okay, ready? It's very short, one minute. And this is about the Earth's carrying capacity. How many people can our planet support? Earth's resources are limited. There's only so much fresh water on the planet and only so much food that we can produce, no matter how efficiently we do it. What if we converted all farmable land to grow food for people, not livestock or poultry? If everyone became a vegetarian, scientists calculate that Earth's three and a half billion acres of farmable land could support around 10 billion people at most. But how soon might we get there? Scientists predict that by 2050, we'll hit a global population of 9 billion, 
and we could reach 10 billion by 2100. But those numbers aren't going to keep going up and up and up. Scientists predict that somewhere between those two milestones, we're going to hang a population U-turn, and the numbers will start to drop. UN estimates of global population trends suggest that families are getting smaller, with data showing that the great majority of countries are experiencing fertility declines. If birth rates drop to replacement levels, 2.1 children per woman replacing their parents and making up for those who die young, and no more, Earth's population will likely stabilize between 9 and 10 billion, just about the maximum that our planet can handle. Population maximum, just one of life's little mysteries. All right, let me go back to the PowerPoint. Okay. Um, all right, so we're at 7.7 .7 billion about. Um, estimates for the carrying capacity of Earth are, like, like she mentioned, about 9 to 10 billion, right? And just to give you a sense, there are things that can happen um, that can start to reduce the population of humans. For example, um, the coronavirus is a really good example. This is um, a single kind of event in our time period where we're, we're going to see a lot of um, a little a decline in a lot of the populations. Um, so it's kind of interesting to think about that might be actually good for the Earth's carrying capacity um, in some ways. All right. So predator prey, we already talked about that. Let's talk really briefly about predator prey adaptations. All right. So predators, what are their adaptations? <laughs> right. They have claws, teeth, they can have poison, they're fast, right? Think about all the predators um, in the environment. We have things like cheetahs, very quick, with big claws, keen sense of smell and taste and all of that. Um, sharks, big giant teeth. We have talons, um, poisons, speed. If you think of the prey, those guys have different kinds of adaptations, such as the ability to hide well, camouflage, spines, odors or toxins, warning colors, mimicry, right? So here, for example, a little crab is very well camouflaged. Here are these bright colors, kind of warning colors, like don't eat me, I don't taste very good. Um, the ability to hide well, spines, um, other things called mimicry, um, kind of the ability to look like something else. Like this looks like I have a giant eyeball and I'm a bigger thing than I actually am, so stay away. All right, and there's two kinds of mimicry out there. Um, the first is called malarian mimicry. And I have, again, a stupid way to remember this. Malarian mimicry are members of a group you should avoid, all right? Those are things, for example, these guys look very similar. One is a kooka bee and one is a yellow jacket. They both have stingers. They both release toxins. One has, was evolutionarily kind of older and the other one looks like it. And it is saying, hey, I look like that guy. You should really avoid us because we are dangerous. Whereas Bastian mimicry is bluffing. Bastian bluffing, Bastian bluffing, right? These guys, one of them has evolved to look like another member, even though it is not dangerous, right? So here, this little hoverfly is completely harmless. However, it has evolved to look like a wasp that is, that is toxic, right? So this is just bluffing, like, ha fooled you. I look dangerous, but I'm not. Whereas malarian mimicry, they are both toxic. Another great example of Bayesian mimicry, which I know that some people I've heard of students knowing in the past, are these two kinds of snakes, right? The scarlet king snake um, is non-venomous, whereas the eastern coral snake is venomous. And I know that stu my students have told me something about ways of remembering this, like yellow ring, red, red, yellow, red. I don't know. If you guys know about it, please let me know, because there's some sort of like little jingle that goes along with how to remember, remember that. All right, so that was kind of about population ecology. And now we're going to kind of go in a level looking at um, community ecology. 
And this is really centering on interactions among organisms, such as predation, competition, and how that affects a community structure, right? Um, so we all learned back in the day, like, I don't know, in fifth grade, I think my son was learning about this, food chains and food webs, all right? Um, and we're not gonna go into crazy detail about this, so don't worry, um, but we, you do have to understand that there's a pathway, to food, a pathway of food energy transfer, all right? Always getting, beginning with the producers, right? And that is called trophic level one. Those are the producers, all right? The trophic levels are steps of a food chain, starting with the producers at the bottom, going to trophic level number two, the little critters that eat the um, producers, trophic level three, the critters that eat level two, and then the top fourth trophic level is usually the apex predators, right, which don't really have any other natural predators. Food webs, which are a more realistic way of looking at kind of the interconnectedness of an ecosystem. All right, so if I put on a diagram with all these organisms, you should be able to kind of make predictions about who would eat who, right? Um, bunnies, deer um, kind of eat the producers, um, then foxes kind of midway through, and then we have other organisms like big birds or whatnot that might be able to eat those foxes, etc. All right, so this is something that you may not have heard about called the pyramid of net production, all right? This represents the loss of energy transfer as you go up a trophic level, right? So we know, um, scientists have kind of been able to show that there's about a million joules of sunlight coming out during any, a specific period of time. And the producers can incorporate that sunlight energy into their organ, into um, basically food energy by converting sunlight into sugars. Um, and then the um, primary consumers, when they eat those producers, um, they gain about you know a thousand joules. The secondary consumers gain less. The tertiary consumers or the apex predators kind of um, can get even less. So as you go up this food chain, you are losing energy transfer. Right. So sorry, I keep moving my face around, but. Whatever, we're trying this for the first time. Zoom with my face and a video. Um, okay, so these are called biomass pyramids. And what this represents is a the, what's called the standing crop, all right? And all that is and is the total dry mass of all of the organisms, right? Dry mass of all of the organisms um, in each trophic level. Most biomass pyramids show a really sharp decrease in biomass at successively higher trophic levels. So as you can see, the dry mass of primary producers is quite high, and then it drastically drops off, and then it can drop off again and again. So the, the number or the total mass of all of the organisms that are tertiary con consumers is very small in comparison to each of the other ones. Biomass pyramids can be kind of interesting though, because some of them actually are inverted, all right? And these are things particularly in aquatic ecosystems, such as a marine um, ecosystem of the oceans. Some aquatic ecosystems show this inverted biomass pyramid, um, showing that producers are consumed so quickly um, that they, they end up outweighing the primary consumers, all right? So the producers get eaten up so quickly, and then the primary consumers, their biomass um, can be higher due to that. So I just wanted to give you a couple examples of those. All right, so ecological niches, all right? So ecolo ecological niches um, kind of um, define the role and the position of a specific species, what its role and position is within its environment, right? So if we look at this little water landscape, the flamingos have an ecological niche that is different than a duck, which is different than this 
crazy bird, which is different than this bird, which is different than this bird. They all live in this community. However, they play different roles and they possess or they have different niches, all right? So flamingos occupy, occupy this niche, whereas the duck occupies this niche, all right? And within even a single tree, you can have different niches, whereas this little warbler feeds in the middle part of the tree. The Cape May warbler feeds only specifically at the tips and the tops of the branches, whereas the yellow rumped warbler feeds only in the lower part of the tree, right? So every single of these warbler species can live within this similar um, tree environment. However, they occupy distinct niches, meaning that they can all live there successfully because they're not competing for resources. A fundamental niche is the niche that a species can potentially occupy. And I'll give you an example of this. So a fundamental niche is what it could occupy if there were no other species and no other competition. So for example, these are called limpets. Um, and you guys I'm sure have all seen these in tide pools. They have a potential niche of extending very um, wide. They can go all the way up to the high tide zone, all the way into the low tide zone. However, due to different kinds of competition within that community, they have a realized niche or the niche that is actually being occupied of a high tidal zone. And that is because there's another species of organisms. I think these are the barnacles. I don't know. Um, anyway, a different kind of species that outcompetes them in the low tide zone. So their realized niche of these limpets is in the high tide zone. Even though fundamentally they can extend throughout that whole area, um, but due to the other competition, they have a realized niche that is different. All right, so key to keystone species, and this is one of my favorite topics in ecology. Um, this, the keystone species play a role in their community that is far more important then its relative abundance might suggest, right? So these um, are species that typically exist in low numbers. And I'll show you a couple examples. Sorry, I have to keep moving my face. Um, so here is an example of a typical food chain. We have the producers being kelp. We have some sea urchins. We have some sea otters. And then we have orcas being the apex predators. All right, and what we're gonna do here is just look at the population numbers. So if we look at sea otters, we see that there, is a, there has been a steady decline in the population, All right? If we look at the sea urchins, and we really only had two main data points to look at here that they collected data. We saw a massive increase in the urchin population as the sea otters declined, All right? With an increase in the sea urchin biomass, we saw a huge drastic decline in the producers, right? And as you can imagine, producers, um, a lot of things rely on these kelp forests or these, um, or these producers, the first trophic level. So if we have a massive decline in that, that can kill the entire community, right? So um, what scientists have shown is that um, the keystone, uh, the removal of the, uh, the sea otters, which were the keystone species, right? They have relatively low abundance in the population, but if you get rid of them, huge effects. You get rid of the sea otter population, that causes mass explosion in the sea urchin population, which then kills the entire kelp forest, right? So we call it a keystone because you guys have seen these kind of puzzles. You remove one piece and the whole thing falls falls apart, right? So sea otters, sharks, sea stars, wolves are all considered keystone species, meaning again, a role, they play a role in their community that is far more important than the relative abundance might suggest, all right? Get rid of a few sea otters, you can kill an entire kelp forest. 
All right, so I'm gonna get out of this and I wanna show you, this is another short video, but it's so cool. This is like, again, my favorite example of keystone species. And it's a really quick video. So I'm gonna get that up and then I'm gonna change my screen again. All right, hopefully this will work. Oh my, ah, okay, let me try that again, <laughs> sorry. Screen sharing stop, let's try that again. We're gonna go here, although the Google is not working right now because my internet is sucking. All right, we're gonna try one more thing. Try this. Nope, my internet is not working. All right, this is going to be, I'm gonna stop the screen share. Sorry, as you guys are dealing with having to watch my technical difficulties. All right, here it goes. So let me go back to my screen share. And I think, right, it's such a cool movie. I love it. It's short, it's only four minutes, but it's worth while. One of the most exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that wolves kill various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years, that the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park, and despite efforts by humans to control them, They'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They'd just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately, those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, birds started moving in. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers um, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes and as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed on it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. Here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less erosion. The channels narrowed. More pools formed. More riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. 
Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transform not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. All right, so I'll go back to my PowerPoint. We only have a few more slides, so don't worry. Um, but I think that is such a beautiful example of keystone species, um, the wolves changing the rivers in Yellowstone. If anybody's never, if people haven't been to Yellowstone, I hope you get to go sometime. It's truly amazing. All right, so um, when we can also have, um, and we see this in California quite often when we have wildfire season, which I was still I was so confused at when we first got here. I was like, wait, there's a whole season for wildfires? Anyway. Um, ecological disturbances, right? These can be wildfires. They can be dramatic weather. They can be catastrophic events. They can be human events, such as um, cutting down rainforests, et cetera. And there's kind of two different ways that we can look at this. Um, and they're called, um, the, they're, after a disturbance, then you get what's called ecological succession, right? The sequence of community changes after a disturbance. Right. So primary succession is where it has been the ecological disturbance was so dramatic, it went all the way down to rock. All right. Then we start getting the mosses or the bryophytes. Then we getting the grasses, shrubs, small trees and then big trees. All right. A secondary um, succession is where the ecological disturbance got all the way down to some grasses, but not bare rock. Right, and then we start the succession from there. Right, so every time you get an ecological succession, the regrowth starts with a, what is called a pioneer species. Here, the pioneer species would be the mosses. Right, in a secondary succession, sparse grasses are the pioneer species. Then we get intermediate, uh, sorry, intermediate species, and then eventually we get to that climax community. Right, a full community with populations. All right, so ecosystems. An ecosystem is all of the organisms in a, given in a given area, as well as their abiotic factors, right? So just a reminder, biotic, living things, abiotic, non-living things. So an ecosystem, all of the biotic and abiotic um, parts of an environment. And these can be many different ones, all right? They can be terrestrial ecosystems, aquatic, or they could be artificial, all right? Ones that humans have created. Um, here are some terrestrial grasslands, forests, deserts. Some aquatic are usually either um, marine or freshwater, meaning oceans, lakes. And then you can also have artificial ecosystems such as aquariums um, or crops, all right? And the biome, um, is any of Earth's major ecosystems, all right? So here we have terrestrial biomes, and these are classified based on the prominent vegetation and climate, all right? So here we have annual um, temperature, here's annual precipitation. At any point, you can make predictions about what terrestrial biomes would do the best there, all right? So obviously, High temperature, high precipitation, we get our rainforests. In Alaska, we have a lot of tundra, right? Low precipitation, low temperature, and everything in between. Aquatic biomes, instead of being classified by vegetation and climate, um, aquatic biomes are usually classified on their physical environment and the depth, all right? So for example, Looking at freshwaters, we have kind of wetlands, rivers, streams, ponds, lakes. In saltwater, we have the open ocean, coral reefs, and intertidal zones, right? Regardless of what kind of biome you're talking about, we are characterizing them by the adaptations um, of environments to that particular environment. Sorry, adaptations of the organisms to that particular environment. 
right? And again, energy flows within an ecosystem, and that depends always on the primary producers, right? So if you look at this diagram, obviously solar energy is what is providing energy here in red to the primary producers, right? Primary producers provide energy to the primary consumers, which provide energy for the secondary consumers, which then um, have waste, which is detritus, which then um, supports energy for the microorganisms, right? If we look at the flow of nutrients, we can see that we also have flow of nutrients from the primary producers all the way up as well. Just as a reminder, our um, Earth is powered by solar energy and only about 1% of that energy um, is converted into chemical energy but through photosynthesis. So we have a huge excess of solar energy. Right? So always energy enters and flows through a system, um, just like the nutrients, um, but the, sorry, energy enters and flows through um, a system and the nutrients cycle within a system, right? They are not left. However, energy, because we always lose excess as heat, goes in and out of, an, out of a system, whereas the nutrients stay within a system. Right? And that leads us to um, energy transfer between different trophic levels. And this is typically about 10% mm, efficiency. Right? So here we're looking at caterpillar. Um, it, has, it, it eats plant material. It spends about a part of the energy, 67 joules on cellular respiration. We spend, it spends a lot, it gets rid of a lot of its energy through feces, right? through pooping. And then, excuse me, it puts some of that energy into new growth, right? So secondary production is the amount of energy in food that is converted to their own biomass or own growth, right? And as you can see here in this caterpillar, it's only a certain percent. The production efficiency is the net secondary production times 100 over energy not assimilated as feces. And I'll give a couple examples of this. So here we have a caterpillar and we have a squirrel and it shows you these kind of energy transfer, energy transfer. So you have to calculate the production efficiency for the caterpillar, right? And if you look at that, and again, I'm gonna try to use my card thingy here. Sorry, it's right in front of my face. So if we look at production efficiency for the caterpillar, it is again the net, um, the net secondary production times 100 over energy not assimilated. So in the caterpillar, it's gonna be 180 times 100 over 180 plus 300, right? And if you calculate that out, you get an energy production, or sorry, a production efficiency of about 36%, right? So again, those numbers here, we have the growth, 180, 320 for cellular respiration. That is the energy not assimilated as feces, whereas the net secondary production um, is only gonna be this 180, all right? If we look at for a squirrel, sorry, my, diet, my picture of a squirrel is like super upsetting and weird, but whatever. Um, if you calculate this out for a squirrel, it is a 2% production efficiency, all right? So those are very different, 36% versus 2%. Insects in general have a very high production efficiency. Birds and mammals have a very low production efficiency. And that's because mammals have to spend so much energy keeping warm <laughs> um, on cellular respiration um, to, for that high metabolic activity, all right? Whereas insects have a much lower. All right, so we are gonna be talking about nutrient cycling, um, meaning the uptake, use, release, storage, and recycling of nutrients in the environment, right? Most ecosystems receive, again, an abundance of cellular energy, but very limited amounts of chemical energy, right? Um, but life depends on recycling of these, all right? So if we look at, for example, at organic material um, available as nutrients. Um, some of those can become fossilized, right? That is organic material 
unavailable as nutrients, such as coal, oil, and peat, meaning we're not eating those. We obviously use those for other types of energy. And in fact, we can burn those as fossil fuels to create more inorganic, um, inorganic uh, uh, materials, right, which can come in and out. Um, and so there's just a lot of nutrient cycling, right? Do you have to know the details of these? No, but I need you to know about them, right? And we have several different kinds of cycling. We have hydro, um, hydro, hydraulical uh, water cycling, right? Which I'm sure you guys have all seen, um, where we get evaporation from the oceans, right? We get then precipitation over the land, that um, we get that precipitation kind of going into the soil, which then runs off as groundwater, right? So forms available to life, mostly liquid water, right? Um, but again, this is especially important for these primary producers. The oceans have about 90 or 97% of water on our biosphere. 2% um, are glaciers and ice, 1% lakes and rivers, right? So oceans are obviously the huge um, part of this water cycle. And this is mainly driven by, again, evaporation and then precipitation, right? Carbon cycling, um, this is all organic molecules, all right? Oops. So here we will start, I'll put myself up here. We start with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This can occur through wood and fossil fuels burning. This is then used in photosynthesis. The primary consumers eat those primary producers. Um, detritus, which is waste again, um, ends up back in the soil. Um, higher level consumers eat those primary consumers, also have waste. Um, and then we kind of cycle again, right? So glucose um, is used by almost all consumers, right? Carbon dioxide, um, we use the, um, Plants use the carbon dioxide to make um, glucose for their photosynthesis. And the major reservoirs or kind of um, pockets of carbon that we use are fossil fuels, right? Um, soils, um, and then plant and animal biomass. And again, photosynthesis is wonderful because it removes that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, and carbon dioxide is then added back to the environment through our cellular respiration. And also burning of fossil fuels can also add to extra carbon dioxide in the environment, right? Nitrogen cycling. This again, nitrogen is in um, amino acids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Um, we have a lot of nitrogen in our environment, er, sorry, in our, in our air, in the atmosphere, right? Plants, um, or sorry, plants often have what are called nitrogen fixing bacteria um, living symbiotically in their in their roots in their roots, right? Um, nitrogen fixing soil also contains a lot of bacteria, right? These are involved in the ammonification, right? So where um, ammonification, man, I really don't like that word. Um, where we have decomposers helping to get that oxygen or get that nitrogen rather and form it into ammonia right ammonia um, then gets converted to nitrites through nitrifying bacteria um, and then you can make more nitrite from nitrites to nitrates um, and then we can have other bacteria which help remove that and put it back into the atmosphere so plants use ammonium and nitrate a lot. Animals use only organic forms of nitrogen. So we really don't use these nitrates, even though they're really important um, for plants. 80% of the atmosphere is um, basically free and available nitrogen. So it's hugely available in our, in our environment. Um, nitrogen fixation is when you convert nitrogen gas to organic nitrogen compounds, right? Um, then we have the phosphorus cycle. And again, phosphorus is in nucleic acids, lipids, and ATP. So here we are getting phosphorus primarily from the rocks in our environment. Um, so we get what's called geological uplifting where weathered phosphate comes off of rocks. 
Um, phosphate can also come out of, um, come out in solution. Uh, phosphate in the soil can then go into the oceans. Um, and then this is again, a cycle. So what's really important about phosphorus is plants absorb phosphate and use it to help make organic compounds. The largest reservoir for phosphorus or the largest pockets in our environment are sedimentary rocks in the oceans. And phosphate is taken up by producers and incorporated into biological molecules, which then can be eaten by consumers. And then we can use them for nucleic acids, lipids, and ATP. All right, so that is it. Um, I was going to do this in two videos. I don't know what happened there, but we finished it all in one. But feel free again to watch this in two videos because it's a little long and I apologize. Remember, there are questions at the end of these PowerPoints. These are more li most likely that you will see those again um, when we have that in-class test. So make sure you go over those. All right. Um, all right. Signing off. Adios.